Welcome back to Memorable Neurology. Today we're going to talk about the cerebellum. On first glance, the cerebellum appears to be a miniature version of the brain that sits behind and below the cerebrum. In many ways, the cerebellum bears more than a passing resemblance to the cerebrum. It has a familiar folded appearance that increases surface area, a pattern of gray matter on the outside and white matter on the inside, and several divisions into multiple lobes. Despite its appearance, however, the cerebellum isn't just a smaller copy of the cerebrum. Instead, it has its own unique functions, primarily in the realm of balance and motor coordination. The cerebellum itself does not generate motor impulses. Remember that those come from the motor cortex in the frontal lobe, just like in the engine in the front of a car. Instead, the cerebellum coordinates motor actions by taking into account your sense of proprioception, or your knowledge about the position of various parts of your body in space at any given time. For example, when you're doing jumping jacks, your arms and legs can't simply repeat the same action over and over. Instead, you need to know when to send your limbs out and when to bring them back in. Your body does this automatically and instinctively by sending proprioceptive and other sensory information to the cerebellum. The cerebellum then coordinates the position of each body part with its intended movement and adjusts the motor signal in a way that irons out the kinks, resulting in a coordinated set of movements. This is why a commonly used exam technique known as the finger-to-nose test is a good demonstration of cerebellar function. Doing this tests the patient's ability to combine sensory information from their eyes with proprioceptive information from their body and put them together into a smooth, coordinated movement. An inability to do this suggests some degree of dysfunction in the cerebellum. The cerebellum is divided into three lobes. This is easiest to see using an unrolled view of the cerebellum, like here. These three lobes are the anterior lobe, the posterior lobe, and a narrow strip of tissue known as the flocculonodular lobe. The anterior and posterior lobes perform the functions that we typically associate with the cerebellum, including both sending signals to and receiving signals from the cerebral cortex and spinal cord. The lateral aspects of the cerebellum coordinate the lateral parts of the body, primarily the arms and legs, while the medial aspect, known as the vermis, coordinates the trunk. Compared to the anterior and posterior lobes, the flocculonodular lobe is the odd one out. Rather than involving itself with coordinating movements of the body, it instead works to coordinate eye movements and balance using sensory information about movement and spatial orientation from the vestibular system in the inner ear. You can remember the function of the flocculonodular lobe by thinking of a flock of seagulls being very noisy, using the noise to help you connect this to the vestibular system in the inner ear. The three lobes of the cerebellum connect to the rest of the body by way of three cerebellar peduncles, with peduncle meaning stalk or stem. Each peduncle has its own function. The superior cerebellar peduncle sends information from the cerebellum to the cortex via the thalamus, while the middle and inferior cerebellar peduncle both receive information from the pons and spinal cord. It is this bidirectional flow of information that allows the cerebellum to accomplish its central goal of using sensory information to fine-tune the body's movement. One important point here is that the nerve tracts coming from the superior cerebellar peduncle cross from left to right and right to left so that, by the time they get to the brainstem, nerve fibers from the left side of the cerebellum are traveling in the right brainstem and vice versa. You can remember this by thinking that the superior cerebellar peduncle sends cross pathways. However, while the superior cerebellar peduncle sends cross pathways, the neurologic deficits seen in cases of unilateral cerebellar damage still end up being ipsilateral to or on the same side as the lesion. This is because motor signals from the cerebellum are dirty double crossers. They not only cross when they leave the cerebellum in the superior cerebellar peduncle, but they then cross again in the medulla, a part of the brainstem that we'll talk about in a future video. This means that cerebellar damage produces neurologic deficits that are ipsilateral to the side of the lesion due to the fact that cerebellar pathways cross twice. One of the best ways of understanding the function of the cerebellum is to see what happens when it becomes dysfunctional. In contrast to injuries of the motor cortex or the internal capsule, 
Injuries of the cerebellum do not generally lead to motor weakness or paralysis. Instead, cerebellar damage is associated with specific deficits in the areas of balance, posture, and coordination that are collectively known as cerebellar signs. You can remember the cerebellar signs by thinking of a dizzy ant balancing three disses or dishes. Let's go over the parts of this mnemonic bit by bit. The first part, dizzy, should remind you of dizziness, or specifically vertigo. Vertigo is a form of dizziness in which someone experiences a distinct sense that things are moving, even when they're not, often described as a sensation of the room spinning. Like a carnival ride, vertigo can be associated with a feeling of nausea. While there are many possible causes of vertigo, those that involve the cerebellum are often called central vertigo and tend to be accompanied by the other signs and symptoms we are about to discuss. The A of ant is for ataxia, which is the clinical term for a lack of coordination. Ataxia can affect many different movements in various parts of the body, including the arms, legs, eyes, and even the muscles in the throat that produce speech. Alcohol is a common cause of truncal ataxia, which can be seen in the unsteady gait that many people develop when they are severely intoxicated. The N in ant is for nystagmus. Nystagmus refers to an involuntary twitch-like movement of the eyes, sometimes called dancing eyes. Like with vertigo, cerebellar dysfunction is only one possible cause of nystagmus, as injuries to other areas can produce this condition as well. T is for tremor. The cerebellum acts to smooth out movements, so dysfunction of the cerebellum is one possible cause of the involuntary, rhythmic, repetitive movement known as a tremor. Balance is to remind you that imbalance, or an inability to maintain a stable posture while walking, is a key cerebellar sign. To compensate, people with cerebellar damage will often attempt to widen their stance or use their arms to balance themselves while walking. Finally, we will talk about the three disses of cerebellar dysfunction. Dystiatokinesia refers to an inability to engage in rapid alternating movements, for example, tapping your fingers or screwing in a light bulb. These sorts of motions require a high degree of motor coordination, which will be lacking in someone with cerebellar damage. Dysarthria refers to an unsteadiness in the pitch or rhythm of speech. Because the cerebellum coordinates movements of the vocal cords as well, someone with cerebellar dysfunction will have unsteadiness that can be heard rather than just seen. Finally, dysmetria refers to an inability to judge distances when moving leading to either overshooting or undershooting the amount of movement required, such as when someone embarrasses themselves by trying to give someone else a high five and missing, like this guy on the left. So, to put it all together, you can remember the cerebellar signs including vertigo, ataxia, nystagmus, tremor, imbalance, dystiatokinesia, dysarthria, and dysmetria by using the mnemonic image of a dizzy ant trying and failing to balance three disses. Whenever a patient presents with any of the characteristic cerebellar signs we've talked about so far, you should immediately think of the cerebellum. And that's it for the video today. Subscribe to be informed when more videos are posted. Thanks for watching. Happy learning.